Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I am Amalgam Ash, and today I want to introduce you to the eventing system in RPG Developer Bakken. When you are working on your Bakken project, you can expect to spend much of your time in two different areas. The first is this area, the map editor, where you will set your scene, place your characters and your elements, and design what your player sees. And the second is this area, the event editor. This is where you're actually going to set up all of the events that take place in your game. All of your game's interactions with NPCs, treasure chests, day-night cycles, scripted boss battles, crafting, gathering, fishing, all of that will be handled by using events. Although the event editor isn't as pretty as the map editor, given enough time and practice, you'll be able to look at events and know exactly what needs to change to make something work. In this episode, I'd like to explain how events work exactly, give you a tour of the event editor, and explain event logic. So here is the event editor. This is what it looks like when you begin to place a completely empty custom event on your map. You can grab the title bar of this window and drag it around your screen to place this somewhere if you don't need it maximized. We don't need all of this gray space taking up the whole screen for this video, so I'll actually be working with it while it is resized here. That way we have just a little bit more to look at while we work, but you're free to resize this window however you like. All of the interactions in your game are handled by events. Sometimes these events are as simple as opening up a treasure chest and getting an item or some gold. Other times, it's a complex system of events that are working together to change the environment in your game dynamically. Events can really be as simple or as complex as you want them to be, and they are very powerful. Events are broken up into several parts. The first part of an event is its event sheet. This can be specified here on the left side of the window. The sheet list. Every event starts with one sheet. You can add more sheets by clicking the plus icon. You can add sheets that run in parallel by pressing the plus icon with the vertical bar. You can rename any given event sheet by clicking the pencil icon, copy event sheets, paste event sheets, and delete event sheets. You must have at least one event sheet though. We'll get to what event sheets are exactly in just a moment. The second section to an event are sheet conditions. The sheet conditions are really why we have different event sheets. For something as simple as a treasure chest, which can be approached and opened without any sort of special tools or keys at any time by the player, we won't need different event sheets or different event conditions. And we can move on to the next section of the event. But if your event is an NPC that walks around the map during the day and goes home and goes to bed at night, or any other kind of event that would have different behaviors depending on a set of conditions, then you would use different event sheets with different sheet conditions. You can think of an event sheet like a piece of paper on which all of the instructions for the event to follow are written. And depending on what the conditions are, that event will refer to different sheets to see what instructions it needs to follow. If you'd like to add conditions to your event, you can click Add Sheet Condition, and this will give you a list of applicable conditions you can add to your event. We can choose from Event Switch, Variable Box, Money, Items, Party, Coordinates, or Collision Detection. The next section is the change of elements during sheet execution. These are the elements of the event that define how it interacts with its environment and how it appears. These are specific to the event sheet. In other words, if your event has more than one event sheet, you can set up your event to behave in different ways or appear in different ways depending on which sheet is active. This is broken up into three sections. The first section is collision settings. We can specify whether this event will collide with the player or with other events, whether it will move when pushed, and whether it has a custom collide range. And if it does have a custom collide range, we can specify what those values are. The next section is movement settings. We can specify the orientation control, the orientation, the movement speed, the movement pattern, the movement frequency, and we can limit the movement range. We can also specify what that limit would be. Finally, we can change the graphic settings of the event. You can specify a 2D or 3D image as well as any animation that might be associated with it. The last part of the event window is the command script. This is broken up into a few sections as well, and you can edit your command script using one of two methods, the panel method, which is shown here, or the text method. You can switch between them by clicking the buttons at the top of the command script section. If we click on text, we'll see what this event will look like in its text form. I prefer working with panels, so I'll choose panel for now, but I'll show you what the text form looks like after we get some commands added to this event. So to sum it up, we have four sections to our event. The first is event sheets, 
where we can define different sets of behaviors for our event if we need to. The second is sheet conditions, where we can specify what conditions need to be met before a given sheet runs. The third is specifying how the event will interact with its environment and how it will appear. And the fourth is the actual set of instructions the event needs to follow with its event sheet. At the bottom of the sheet list is the C Sharp program assignment. Now, if you're not using plugins, you can completely ignore this every time you make an event. But if you are using plugins, this is exactly where you will define your plugin. Plugin scripts have to be associated with common events, and this is where that association takes place. You can see when I click on this that I have a choice of two plugins. These are two plugins that I have installed previously, the crafting system and the test play assistant script. Being able to specify the appearance of our event is based on the active sheet. And this is important because when you go to a treasure chest and open it, you might want that treasure chest to appear as though it has been opened. This is where you would find that appearance. If you'd like an open treasure chest, then your event would need two sheets. Your first sheet would define a treasure chest that had not yet been opened, and your second sheet would define a treasure chest that had been opened and that no longer had any treasure in it. We'll make this treasure chest in just a moment. For our command scripts, we have two more options that we can look over. Before we get into the actual event commands, we have an import and an export button. Using these, you can bring in external command scripts, such as those found in the official RPG Developer Bakken Discord, or export your own if you're planning on sharing different event systems with other people. Taking a look at the command script section, when an event's sheet conditions are true and a given sheet activates, there are multiple ways that an event can start. We can specify how the event starts using the event starts panel at the very top of the command script section. We can also specify here whether the event will ignore elevation and whether it will react from one step ahead. Ignore elevation is useful if you have an event that is going to be on a different level than the player, such as an NPC on top of a building or on top of a cliff or at the bottom of a pit. As long as the player and the NPC are next to each other, it doesn't matter if the NPC is much farther above or below the player. With this box checked, they'll be able to interact. With this box unchecked, you won't be able to interact with that NPC unless you're on the same plane as them, roughly. React from one step ahead is good to use if your NPC is behind a counter. This will ensure that your player can interact with them even if they're up to one tile away. So for your innkeepers and shopkeepers that are behind counters, or your prisoners behind cells, or NPCs behind closed doors, things like that, React from one step ahead is useful. Now the event's behavior and appearance will activate as soon as the map loads in, provided the sheet conditions are true, unless the event is a common event, which we'll talk about later. But the instructions will carry out after the event starts. There are multiple ways we can get the event to start, and the first is when player talks. This is the most common way to activate an event, and that's why it's at the top of the list. That's why it's default. When you walk up to an NPC or a treasure chest or a door, any sort of event, you can activate it simply by pressing the activation key. Walk up to an NPC and press A, for example, to talk to them. That is what this option means. The next option is when player makes contact with the event. This will activate the event as soon as your player moves into it. Perhaps you wish to be able to open doors without the player needing to press a button to do so. You can just walk into a door to open it with this selection. In some games, the player can walk up to NPCs and begin interacting with them as soon as they make contact without having to press any buttons. That's another good use for this selection. The third is when event makes contact with player. This is the same as when player makes contact with event, but will activate as soon as the event is moving into the player. They're very similar, but there are subtle differences in their activation methods. Automatically start only once. As soon as the player enters the map that contains this event and the conditions are true, this set of instructions will carry out, but only once. This is good to use to introduce a map area for the first time. Perhaps use several different camera views to pan around the scene and show distinctive features of the map, key NPCs, or the title of the area, and then never again. Be careful if using automatically start repeat. If the sheet conditions are true, this will activate the event instructions as soon as the player enters the map, and then when the instructions are done, it will simply repeat them over again, in the foreground, so to speak. The player won't be able to do anything unless the event basically allows them to do so. Automatically start only once in parallel 
is different than automatically start only once in that the event will carry out its sheet instructions without interrupting the player. As soon as the player enters the map, the event will activate, but will just go about its business until it reaches the end of its instruction sheet. This can be useful if you have an NPC that's gonna go from one side of the map to the other, and they're not gonna do it over and over again, but just once. Perhaps you want them to appear on one side of the map, walk over to the other side of the map, and then disappear. That's when you might use automatically start only once in parallel. It's in parallel to the player's actions. So the player is free to move about and do as they like while this event is activated. Automatically start repeat in parallel is useful for having NPCs walk around specified paths or for weather systems, time systems, season systems, timed gathering nodes, gardening and farming systems. Automatically start repeat in parallel will allow the event to activate as soon as the player enters the map, provided the sheet conditions are true, and then when it reaches the end of its instruction sheet, as long as the conditions are still true, it will repeat them. And all the while, the player will be free to move around the map and do as they like uninterrupted. Our list of event commands is looking pretty bare and boring, so we can click the plus icon to bring up the command selector. There are a lot of different commands available to us, and there are a lot of different categories that separate these commands. So we'll go over that in the next episode. For now, I hope you feel more comfortable knowing how events work in the world of Bakin. Please look forward to the next episode, and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content and want more Premier Bakin education. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.